Good afternoon and welcome to this conversation with Mrs. Nadia Calvino, jointly organized by the LSE European Institute and the Cañada Blanc Center, also here at the LSE. My name is Andres Rodriguez Pose. I hold the Princesa de Asturias chair and direct the Cañada Blanc Center, and I am your host today. This afternoon, we have the enormous, the great privilege of having with us in conversation, Mrs. Nadia Calvino. Mrs. Calvino is currently first Vice President of Spain and Minister for the Economy and Digitalization. She has recently been appointed Chair of the International Monetary and Financial Committee of the International Monetary Fund with a two-year mandate. An economist and a lawyer by training, she has a wealth of experience working for first the Ministry of the Economy in Spain and later for 12 years in the European Commission in different positions, including the all important and I would say all powerful uh, position of director general in charge of the budget. She holds numerous Spanish and international prizes and has published a large number of articles. Last but not least, she has a, I would say strong connection to the LSE as her daughter Alina completed the MSc in environmental policy and regulation just a few short years ago. Mrs. Calvino will make a presentation on the current economic recovery with a particular focus on the policy lessons from the pandemic and the way ahead. Her presentation will be followed by a dialogue with Professor Ian Begg, who is a professor at the European Institute here at the LSE. After this dialogue, we will have a round of questions from the audience. I would therefore invite and encourage all of you to place your questions at any time during this conversation in the question and answer function, clearly stating your name, your position, and then the question. Considering time, I will be selecting questions and asking them to Mrs. Cavigno. So without further ado, Madam Vice President, it's our great pleasure to have you here with us and the floor is entirely yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, dear Andres. It's, it's a great pleasure to participate in this conversation with you, also with Professor Ian Begg at the London School of, uh, School of Economics and Political Science. And uh, indeed, uh, as you, you shared with the audience, since we are in a, in a family environment, indeed, I have, uh, I, my daughter did do her master's uh, degree in, there in the LSE, and we only have very good memories and a very good uh, experience when we look back on, on that on those years and that makes it you know twice the pleasure to be doubles the pleasure of being with you today but i am particularly interested and that's why i was i was uh, glad to accept the your kind invitation i am particularly interested in talking to students listening to their questions to their concerns because we are actually at a at a key moment uh, in from a historical point of view one where we have to really make the right decisions that will shape the future uh, uh, in the UK, in Spain, at European level, at global level. We have to, to see how we tackle some of the global challenges that we're all confronted with. And uh, I think it is a key that we give the voice and we listen to the younger generations because it is their future we're trying to shape and we're trying to, uh, to steer, you know, when we make our, our decisions uh, currently. So I, I'll just uh, try to share with you in my opening remarks, three key uh, ideas, and then I'll be very happy to take any questions from the audience. Now, the first point I want to share with you uh, has to do with the response to the pandemic. Uh, obviously, these last two years uh, have been very difficult from all points of view, from a personal point of view, a professional point of view, uh, for me being a, being a minister and then a vice president in, in a government having to deal with the very significant uh, shock, you know, from a health, from a social and, and economic point of view. These two years have been, uh, many, many people say it often, but we should, you know, we have to repeat it, unprecedented. We have had to face unprecedented challenges and make unprecedented decisions without a roadmap, without a blueprint, because never in our history had we, in our lifetimes and in recent history, had we been uh, confronted with this kind of, of crisis in our, um, part of the world. And I think that the response 
really should make us proud because we were able to put together a response in a coordinated manner, not only uh, within the EU, but also more broadly uh, throughout the whole multilateral institutional framework. And we were therefore very uh, much more efficient uh, with impactful uh, actions. Um, it, you know, starting from the vaccine development, it is, uh, many say it, it is a miracle, you know, that it is uh, incredible that our science was able to develop the vaccines and we were able to deploy these uh, large vaccine programs in an efficient manner in such a short period of time. But we also coordinated our fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, we have been able to deploy an unprecedented safety net to provide to protect companies, to protect workers, to protect households' incomes. In the, in the case of Spain, since March 2020, we set in place an unprecedented package with liquidity, solvency support, job protection furlough schemes, also income support for self-employed workers and, and most vulnerable part of our society. And this is a very different response to the previous financial crisis. Our estimate is that without our uh, measures, the drop in GDP would have exceeded 25%. More than 3 million jobs would have been lost, uh, and there would have been a very serious uh, impact from a, with a structural long-term um, lasting effect. Uh, measures taken throughout the world uh, minimized uh, the impact and also uh, have shown something that we should have known but maybe we had forgotten in the past which is that it is much more efficient and cheaper to protect than to let something be destroyed and then have to rebuild uh, from scratch so this time around uh, we have protected a, a solid basis for the recovery at a very significant fiscal uh, impact with a very significant fiscal impact uh, i was just uh, today we got the data uh, concerning debt, public debt uh, last year in 2021. We had to issue between 2020 and 2021 around 150 billion euros in extra debt. But thanks to this fast response, we already uh, had very strong growth last year. Tax revenues increased also uh, in, in a very clear manner. They are already above pre-pandemic levels. And that has, has enabled Spain to resume the downward trend of debt to GDP and deficit to GDP ratios already in 2021. And these together with us reaching also uh, employment and unemployment levels that were not achieved in the country since not only before the uh, pandemic, but before the financial crisis that, that uh, started in 2008. So, this, I think, uh, means, and this is the, the closing idea in my first point, that we got phase one right. This time around, the coordinated response at a global level has enabled us to be effective in trying to uh, minimize the negative impact of an unprecedented, a black swan kind of uh, event. Second uh, key idea is the way ahead. And here, I really think we need a forward-looking uh, approach, one that would allow us to continue to make the right decisions in the short run, but without losing sight of the long-term objectives. Uh, this time around, luckily, not only have we a European response that has been effective in the short run, but also we have a plan. We have a recovery plan. We have this unprecedented 750 billion investment uh, program, the next generation EU, uh, new mechanisms whereby uh, European countries have decided, EU countries have decided to borrow together so as to invest together in our common future. And so as to be able to deploy in parallel our shared agendas, and notably the green agenda and also the digital transformation. Now, the Spanish recovery plan adds two other principles to these two uh, key axes, uh, social and territorial cohesion and gender equality. This makes probably the Spanish recovery plan quite uh, unique, but we think that these four axes and principles should be guiding all our investment efforts, all our reforms, if we want to succeed in, in having a more sustainable and, and inclusive uh, development uh, growth model. Now, the starting point in, in 2022 is good. Uh, we have reached uh, employment levels that were not seen since 2008. More than 20 million persons are, have jobs in Spain. Our unemployment rate has gone down to 13.3%. Um, 
And now the most important challenge is to ensure that this is not a transitory bounce back, but a solid, strong and, and sustained uh, recovery. One that allows us to also modernize our economies. And here, another interesting feature is not only that we have an unprecedented financial support to undertake this recovery plan, but it is also that there is a, a, an incredible alignment of narratives throughout the world. Uh, Professor Ian Beck maybe will want to comment on this and, and uh, Professor Rodriguez Cosse. I have been around for a long time, as, as you already said, and never would have I imagined that we would have the IMF uh, or the G20 um, family, the, um, the, the, the European Union and, and all international institutions and analysts are having a very different approach to this recovery as, as compared to the past. There is, I think, a very strong awareness of the need to ensure that growth is sustained, sustainable and inclusive. Uh, that our fiscal rules should be growth friendly. And I think that this is due to the increased awareness that we are facing uh, very significant challenges and we cannot just dust off policies from the past. Uh, and notably, we cannot go back to those that we applied after the 2008 financial crisis. And, and Spain is again a, a key example at, ha at hand because uh, some of the of the most uh, clear scarring effects of the crisis, the financial crisis, and the response that that we provided at that uh, stage, uh, some of those uh, scars are mostly visible in in my country. Uh, for example, when it comes to the drop of private and public investment, normally public investment is the first casualty of any fiscal consolidation plan. Well, uh, we did uh, have a significant drop in, in public investment. Many years, this stayed be, below the uh, net uh, level, the minimum uh, level that would be needed just to maintain the infrastructures. This is talking about highways and, and uh, train stations, but it's also hospitals and schools, public buildings, and, and of course, R&D. So, and we all know that investment is key to have stronger growth in, in the future. So that uh, clearly has been dragging potential growth because of this uh, response. Likewise, uh, one of the casualties also, one of the negative uh, effects of that uh, crisis was uh, inequality going up. And again, in Spain, we saw some uh, elements and features uh, which do not correspond to a rich country, uh, child poverty indicators, uh, inequality indicators. I know that Professor Rodriguez Posse has been researching a lot on places that don't matter, deindustrialization, depopulation in many parts of the country. And so this is, this is I think, a, a key element to focus on as we move ahead. And it is clear to, clear to focus on, on fairness because we are confronted with a major technological revolution. And like all uh, industrial revolutions of the past, this has an impact on the way uh, the economy functions, on the way corporates function, also in the way uh, the labor market works, but also our societies and our political systems are impacted by these changes. And so we have to make sure that we uh, make sure, you know, we have to make sure that the way ahead is one that reinforces our rights, our values, our, our social market economies, and not the other way around. Um, uh, I already mentioned the important uh, public debt, the issuance that was needed to respond to the pandemic. Luckily, thanks to strong growth, we are already resuming the, the downward path. But this means that we have to make right now the right decisions because these uh, additional debt could be a burden on future generations. If we not, do not ensure that we have strong growth and also that we take this uh, unique opportunity to modernize our economy and move to a more uh, sustainable uh, new growth model from a financial and economic point of view, but also environmental and social. Let me move uh, to my third and, and final point, which is one I, I you know, came uh, at the later stage as I was reflecting on these issues, and it's a word on social sciences. Uh, now, since I'm speaking to students uh, in the in the community, in the ecosystem of the London School of Economics and Political Science, you know, I thought it would be interesting to share with you a more personal uh, reflection. And my own background, as, as Professor Rodriguez Posse uh, explained, is, is one of an economy. I am also a lawyer, and currently I have I am serving with a, a political position. 
But I think that these points uh, really are applicable, whatever the discipline that you are uh, currently studying or you are uh, currently working on. And I would say that in such a fast moving environment, there is a great opportunity for the creation, the emergence of new ideas. Um, uh, throughout history, economic policy has always been part of the dominant political paradigm, and it has always been in parallel with the reality that it was trying to explain and, and to change. It's difficult to know what determines what, but there has been a, a, a constant alignment. Um, you must, uh, I'm sure you know this quote uh, by, by Lord Keynes, who said, you know, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. <laughs> and it is true that we usually think, oh, this is new, this is unprecedented. And when we look back, most things have already been said. But this time around, I really do think there is a scope and space for the emergence of new ideas and a new paradigm. Classical economists were at the heart of the Industrial Revolution, and then Keynes and Keynesianism lived through the Great Depression and, and beyond, and the New Deal. Monetarism grew with the concerns about stagflation, and then we got new classic macro with uh, the uh, fall of the, I mean, the, the Cold War. Um, the new Keynesianism was to a certain extent the intellectual backbone of the Third Way. And right now, I feel there's a new paradigm in the making because there is this alignment of planets I referred to a moment ago. All international institutions and governments seem to be having a different approach in terms of the, not, not the economic policy as much as the political economy that is needed uh, right now. And uh, from a, a more scientific point of view and academic point of view, there is a mixture of macro and micro approaches uh, that are increasingly, I think, focusing on real human behavior. And this requires a more integrated approach to uh, economics and to economic policy, uh, of course. We are always very directly linked uh, and connected to uh, law, to politics, to um, philosophy, uh, obviously also geography, uh, also uh, sociology. But I think that increasingly we have to also look at mathematics, biology, the next, uh, the, the rest of the natural science sciences, and of course psychology. And all these sciences and all these branches of knowledge have to come together to, to be able to make the right decisions right now. I was just thinking we really have to maybe move from the traditional homo economicus and maybe start thinking about the real homo sapiens sapiens, you know, the one that has all these features and complexities uh, and is also determined by geographical and, and political circumstances. Well, I leave this with you. I am probably speaking to the to the Pope, you know, preaching to the Pope on, on this. You're probably already thinking a lot about these issues, but I think this is a very exciting uh, time from many points of view. It would have been better not to have to be confronted with these uh, unprecedented challenges and tough decisions, but uh, I do uh, see a great opportunity ahead if we do make the right decisions now, a great opportunity for living a, a better world for the younger generations. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. So now I'm going to introduce Ian Begg, who is going to be leading the first part of the dialogue with uh, uh, Madam Calvino. So please, Ian, go ahead. Thank you very much, Andres. And uh, thank you, Madam Vice President, or I'm sure I can still call you Nadia, for, for your very uh, careful and well thought out introduction. You probably know from the times we've been on platforms together previously that I'm not going to be uh, completely positive towards you. I'm going to raise some awkward questions as usual, as is my right as a defunct economist. <laughs> and let, let me first ask a, two or three questions about uh, Spain's trajectory, because there are things there that are both positive and maybe potentially alarming. Now, you referred, I think, with good reason to the fact that the growth in the last year has been extremely uh, strong, and as a result, you have managed to lower the debt to GDP ratio. However, the level is still very close to 120%. Does that alarm you? Well, thanks very much, Ian. You know, I would be surprised if you weren't a bit uh, provocative when, uh, when having this dialogue, which is part of the fun of being together today. So um, 
well one one interesting development in the last in the last years which is a testimony to the very different response that we have given to this crisis as compared to the past one from the perspective of monetary policy has been the fact that our long term sustainability uh, debt sustainability has actually improved uh, we have seen last year our a big share of the debt we issued was at negative interest rates. The average interest rate of outstanding debt has gone down to a record around 1.6%. Interest rate payments as a, as a share of GDP have dropped below 2%. And we have been able to also extend the average maturity of our debt beyond eight years. This means that in, in the coming uh, years, we expect uh, the uh, sustainability to continue to improve, even in an environment of a progressive increase of, of interest rates. Uh, of course, this should not lead to any complacency, and that is why we're so uh, committed you know, to continuing to reduce the debt to GDP ratio and to start already, as of last year, absorbing the extra debt issued uh, to respond to the pandemic. But this needs to be done in a growth friendly uh, and job creation friendly environment, because we see that this is the best way to absorb this debt in a manner which is also sustainable uh, from a, a social, from an economic, from a financial, you know, from all points of view. This, I think, is going to be the, the leading approach of, of European institutions when we approach the broader debate of our, of our fiscal rules with a more realistic and pragmatic approach than maybe in, in a decade ago. All right, thank, thanks. That's a very clear answer. The second area I want to turn to is when you referred and quite rightly to the, the boom in employment in Spain as a, a very encouraging sign for you. And you mentioned that the unemployment rate had fallen to 13%. 13% in Germany or the UK would be a trigger for revolution these days. And another point I want to raise is a long standing Achilles heel of, of the Spanish economy is the extremely high youth unemployment rate, which I, I believe is still around 30%. Yes, it looks like good news, but is it good enough news? Yes, that, that is uh, undoubtedly uh, our top priority is to reduce the unemployment rate and, and notably the youth unemployment rate, which has been dragging growth and prosperity in our country for decades. This is not a, a recent uh, problem. This has been for mm. you know, many, many years, uh, are the, the key problem of the country. Uh, now, the evolution has been outstanding, remarkable, in the sense that youth unemployment dropped last year for uh, by uh, nine points. Nine percentage points. It is still, of course, uh, very high, but we are going down to to levels which which were, uh, you know, pre-pandemic levels. And in terms of the general unemployment rate, uh, we are before the um, uh, financial crisis levels, uh, with a very different labor market and a very different economy, because uh, the construction, the building sector, represents around half of what it did in two thousand and seven. It was like 12% of employment is around 6% now. Uh, the, the shape of the jobs has changed also. There's a higher weight of uh, high quality and high value added jobs. I would also add a very uh, important uh, uh, target for us, which is reducing school abandonment for the young. And we see that when we got to, to the government, it was around 18%, which is one of the highest in Europe. It has gone down to around 13% also now which gives us hope you know that we're on the right track and together with the labor market reform that has started to to be implemented in january this will lead to also to better quality jobs where people invest in human capital and this improves you know generates a virtuous circle of uh, of uh, uh, productivity and 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 growth uh, this is this is our bet with the recovery plan we're going to heavily invest in the green transition digital transition but also education vocational training r d uh, with a, with a clear focus on on reducing unemployment creating good quality jobs and giving opportunities to the young as i was saying uh, a moment ago Yes, and I also note the, the success you have had as, as the, an, e, an economic ministry in uh, reducing the proportion of uh, short term contracts uh, and moving on to the indefinidos, the, the, the indefinite contracts, which are, again have been a long standing problem of the Spanish economy. 
One other area that is a potential concern for me looking at Spain as an outside defunct economist is the, the sectoral mix. I think it's no secret that the Spanish economy depends pretty heavily on its earnings through tourism. And if I understand correctly, last year, tourist arrivals were something like 60% down compared with 2019. Now, I know that once you relax re restrictions, you'd expect to see an improvement in those numbers. But there's a, a, perhaps a more fundamental question about the scarring effect of a pandemic as to whether tourism will ever recover to what it used to be. Do you have sleepless nights on this? <laughs> this is this is uh, one of the issues that that has marked uh, uh, our country uh, in the wake of the pandemic because the impact on our economy has been stronger sharper than in other countries precisely due to the fact that around 15 percent of, of our economic uh, activity comes from tourism spain is one of the countries that has the strongest uh, uh, tourism industry a real industry and this, um, this of course, uh, has uh, has been a signal or a, an element of, of uh, vulnerability in the wake of the pandemic. Whereas, actually, it was a strength in the previous financial crisis. It was one of the drivers of the of the strong recovery after the the financial crisis, you know, 15 years ago. So, what our approach uh, with our with the recovery plan is is twofold. On the one hand, we think that we need to transform the whole economy. It is not a matter of saying, oh, we don't want to pursue this path or this other uh, or this other sector. We want to ensure that all sectors move to a greener, more digital uh, way of functioning, and therefore that we improve the quality of jobs, R&D, and the modernization of the whole economy. And then in parallel, we are undertaking some strategic projects of a large scale that are uh, um, existential, uh, I, I would say, to the future of our country. Uh, just to give you an example, the car manufacturing industry. So Spain, other than being a, a wonderful place for tourism, and I would invite all of those watching this today to come to Spain uh, as of uh, the spring, you know, and, and profit for this uh, wonderful industry. But the the uh, car, uh, Spain is the second car manufacturer and exporter in the EU, second only to Germany. So we need to be in the leading group developing the electric and connected car of the future. And so we have identified this is our first strategic project. We're going to be investing around 4 billion euros in public money and, and multiple of that in, in private investment. All car manufacturers uh, present in the country are committed to working together on the whole value chain with a view to modernizing the car manufacturing industry. Likewise, with agrofood is another sector where Spain is the fourth largest player in Europe, one of the eight largest players in the world. We want to modernize that industry. Uh, likewise, when we're talking about the new knowledge economy and Spanish is a language that obviously is an important asset, we want to make sure that artificial intelligence also thinks in Spanish, that we profit, you know, we leverage the language, uh, the importance of language in the new knowledge economy. Uh, likewise, with, so we are identifying a number of areas where we're going to really focus in the energy of the private and the public sector working together to modernize and to have a material uh, impact on the whole economy. That is the approach of the recovery plan, which is very challenging. It's an unprecedented volume of investment, massive reform effort, but it is also a unique opportunity to really be uh, you know, in the leading uh, group of the new uh, digital and, and green uh, transformation that is uh, taking place and have, uh, has accelerated as a consequence of the pandemic. Thanks very much. Um... I know I've only have three or four minutes left, so let, let me turn next to a couple of questions concerning the European level of response. You, you emphasised how much Next Generation EU was facilitating the, the changes that are, we're hoping to see take place in the European economy. But as we know, Next Generation EU is a temporary instrument. Do you think that the EU needs something more permanent and as a consequence, going back to your, your old responsibilities, a bigger regular EU budget. Yes, well, um, I knew this I was think, a difficult one. <laughs> no, I, it is not difficult. This is something that obviously we're thinking a lot about and we will be confronted with this discussion 
as we approach the moment, the end of this multi-annual financial framework, and we need to see how to fund the debt that has been issued at European level and whether or not to have new own resources. Let me give you uh, a, pre, um, a heads up, you know, Spain strongly supports new own resources uh, so that we make sure that we have a stronger funding uh, mechanism for the for the European bus, uh, budget. But right now, I think we have to focus in making this a success. If the next generation EU recovery program is a success, there will be a strong argument to have a more structural uh, counter cyclical uh, instrument going forward, a stabilization mechanism on the fiscal side uh, going forward. Uh, so that's why it is uh, so important that we make this a success and countries such as Italy and Spain that are the main uh, countries leading these recovery plans, I think that we're devoting 180% of our energy to trying to make this a success, not only for, for uh, which is not only key for our countries, but it is also uh, essential to shape, uh, as you suggest, the future of the, of the EU. Thanks. So, Andres, you will share it with me when we're going on too long, because I could talk to Nadia all day if I had the opportunity. But my, my next question is a broader topic. You, you already hinted at it. Normalization of economic policies, particularly monetary policy, is something in the pipeline. We don't quite know how long it's going to take for the arm wrestle between, shall we say, the Germans and the south of Europe will take to resolve itself. But at some point, interest rates are going to rise. The most heavily indebted countries in the EU are in the south, Italy and Greece, but to some extent still Spain. Are you going to be able to cope with normalization of interest rates? And beyond that, we, we you mentioned the suspension of the Stability and Growth Pact. Big questions arise about what happens next with the, either replacement fiscal rules or even abandonment of fiscal rules. I know that that's a big series of questions, and I think that probably exhausts my scope for asking any to you. Well, I mean, on 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 the impact of uh, of a change or a turn in in monetary policy, I think that we have been uh, expecting this to happen, and uh, the approach of the ECB is is one of prudence. I am quite convinced they will continue to be quite uh, prudent in their decision making process. They are very well aware of the risks of a premature withdrawal of the support uh, mechanisms. Uh, I think Madame Lagarde uh, was making some public statements only some days ago that were quite uh, quite straightforward and to the point uh, in this regard. So uh, in the coming years, what we expect, as I said a moment ago, is the, the average interest rate will continue to go down because we are right now we're refinancing debt that was issued three, five, ten years ago at a much higher interest rate. And uh, we just issued, just to give you an idea, we just issued uh, some days ago a 30-year bond, which closed at an interest rate of 1.9%, a 30-year bond at 1.9% uh, with a record demand, uh, which, of course, I mean, in a, in a very volatile market environment, this was uh, some days ago uh, with a lot of uh, un, you know, instability. And this interest rate uh, should give us an idea of what the market anticipates is going to happen to inflation and interest rates in the in the mid to long run also. So, uh, of course, uh, being prudent, watchful, and that's why we have been extremely prudent with our fiscal policy and we already started to reduce our deficits and debt. We have no time to lose to, to ensure uh, that we continue to reinforce financial and fiscal sustainability in the long run, but it has to be done in a growth a uh, friendly environment, you know, preserving uh, growth and, and job creation. And this is linked to the fiscal rule debate. I think that uh, as of the Eurogroup ECOFIN of March, this debate is going to intensify. Um, we certainly have to make sure that we have rules which are fit for purpose. And I think all countries are starting with a quite realistic approach that the uh, starting uh, debt to GDP rates are very different to the ones we had pre-pandemic. In the case of Spain, we were in a downward trend that was broken. We went up to around 120% of GDP. Luckily, now we've gone down to 118.7. And we are, our expectation is to continue to go down as fast as possible. But uh, obviously, the starting point is very different for all countries. I think all countries are also very well aware that we need to undertake massive public investment on the green and digital fronts, if we want to succeed with these uh, strategic and, and structural transformations. Uh, 
And I think all countries are aware that we shouldn't go back to the old trenches, to the old debates of the past, you know, just dusting off, as I said a moment ago, uh, old recipes and, and going back to these um, north, south, east, west, uh, rich, uh, large, small kind of, of debate, because we are on the same boat, actually. The pandemic has shown that we're stronger when we act in a in a coordinated manner, and I really I really hope that this will continue to be the spirit going forward. At least that's what I see so far. Okay, Andres, I think I hand back to you now. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you very much uh, to Madam Vice President for a very clear and concise answers. And the questions from the audience have been coming thick and fast. Uh, there are many questions, particularly from students here at the LSE, and I know that you're keen to hear. Uh, what the students have to say. So I'm just going to start firing away on their behalf. The first question is from Agustin Gonzalez Agote, uh, who is an LSE student uh, from Madrid. And uh, it's related to something you mentioned before about the structural weaknesses and the labor reform. He says, this week, the IMF said that it welcomed the new labor reform passed by the current Spanish government. He would like to know how effective uh, will it be at addressing Spain's, in your opinion, structural weaknesses? Yes, that, that's an excellent question because uh, labor market um, dysfunctioning, uh, malfunctioning has been uh, one of the weaknesses that has been uh, dragging, as I said, growth and, and welfare in, in Spain for decades. And so we have had um, a, a, a unique opportunity to try to tackle all these shortcomings. And we have done it through an intense dialogue with social partners. We reached an agreement. It was a very intense negotiation at the end of last year with the unions and with the business representatives. And this, this gives the labor market reform a very strong, uh, um, how do you say, a legitimacy from a social and political point of view, because it does reflect the positions and the equilibrium, the balance between the positions of the, of the main uh, social partners in the country. And this labor market reform is uh, tackling the uh, outstanding temporary um, nature of, of contracts. Uh, Ian was referring to this a, a moment ago. Spain has around 25% of contracts signed in Spain are temporary contracts, extremely short-term uh, contracts as compared to the 15% average in the EU. And we have to Europeanize our labor market. Uh, so we have uh, addressed this with the labor market reform. We have created additional uh, internal flexibility instruments for companies so that they can adjust to variations in demand or structural changes without having to resort to high temporary uh, and precariousness of jobs or firing uh, massive, massively uh, their, their workers. And we have also tackled the um, bags, the, the corners where there was um, uh, additional precariousness due to the race to the bottom in wage setting mechanisms, uh, for example, at multi-service uh, large companies. And these together has created a package which already has seems to be starting a new trend. So in January and the, the, these weeks in, in February, what we see is a jump in the number of permanent contracts, indefinidos, as compared to the total number of contracts. Uh, some uh, elements of the reform have not yet uh, kicked in because of the, we, we gave a, a transitory period. But what we see is that some of them are already being effective. And I hope that we will start very soon seeing this structural change in the way the, the labor market works, which would give incentives for uh, workers to uh, invest in their own training and reskilling, companies to invest in their workers' uh, skilling, and more importantly, to improve the quality of jobs for the young and women, which have are the most vulnerable when it comes to the quality of the jobs in the, in the Spanish labor market. Thank you very much. There are a bunch of questions uh, on the recovery plan, and I think they're linked, but so I'm going to give you the first one, and uh, hopefully we'll go into the next ones in a moment. Ilan Mounier, uh, an MSc student in political economy uh, and the political economy of Europe at the European Institute, asks about the recovery plan, saying that in the Spanish recovery plan, how do you link social territorial cohesion and the fight against gender inequalities with the green transi transition. 
Yeah, that is a that is a very uh, very good question and one where <laughs> probably we could spend hours now reflecting on the interconnectedness of all of these and also the political implications which we which we see in Spain as we have seen in other parts of of Europe. What we have tried to do is to ensure that all the investment programs and the reforms are looking at the four axes in a cross-cutting manner. So that when we are talking about, for example, uh, a strategic project for the modernization of the agri-food sector, it is aiming at uh, digitalization, green uh, environmental sustainability, but it also looks at social and territorial cohesion so that we ensure that there is a representation of companies in different parts of the country, large and small companies, that uh, we, we uh, improve also the, um, the functioning you know, of the whole interaction between companies and, and workers. And if possible, we also have a specific attention to gender equality in terms of supporting companies which are led by women or which are uh, where women have a, a leading role, I mean, a, a strong role. No? Uh, in our uh, digital um, uh, transformation programs, for example, we have created some specific vehicles and instruments to support startups which are led by women. So what we're trying to do is to give these digital green but also a purple in the sense of gender equality and and territorial uh, approach both acting on the horizontal point of view with all the investment programs but also from a vertical point of view with specific requirements in some strategic uh, programs and actually these days i am uh, speaking to the different um, uh, presidents and the governments of the regions to make sure that the recovery plan materializes and and reaches the whole country, all the provinces, and particularly pays attention to um, areas where there's a stronger risk of deindustrialization or depopulation. In that respect, there seems to be a question more specific about the focus on social and territorial cohesion. If you could elaborate much further on what would it involve and how it would be achieved. This is from Caroline Gray, who's a lecturer in politics and international relations at Aston University. But it is related to the next one from Andoni Nebreda, uh, Montes Nebreda, who's a visiting researcher at the OECD, who's talking about the potential clash between the environmental goals on the one hand and the territorial cohesion uh, on the other, he says that new environmental taxes could harm particularly rural areas, which we know as places that don't matter, and we increasingly know as that uh, there's places in, in the literature of geographies of despair. How should this distributive issue be addressed? And what, how is Spain addressing that potential problem? Well, this is indeed a very, a very good, uh, a very important discussion, a very complex uh, discussion, and it's particularly complex in a country such as Spain, which is not only very large, but very heterogeneous from the point of view of the geographic endowments, from the uh, point of view of the social distribution, economic distribution of the different productive sectors, um, you know, from all points of view, um, also food is very different in the different parts of Spain. You know, we have a very varied, very rich country uh, with uh, three layers of governments, with regional governments having a very strong role to play when it comes to education, when it comes to health and other public services, but also the local governments have an important role to play, for example, when authorizing the deployment of renewables. So this requires a quite, a quite um, complex, quite rich uh, um, governance uh, architecture, which we are setting in place and we have been implementing already last year with different uh, fora and meetings uh, at different levels of government to make sure that we're all understanding, you know, where we're heading towards. Uh, the, all the programs uh, in, the, in, the, in the plan uh, put together, those that have a social and territorial cohesion, uh, we call it the uh, demographic challenge uh, approach, but it's mainly focusing on this issue of aging and depopulation of parts of our country. All programs put together amount to around 10 billion euros in, in investment. This is coordinated by uh, another vice president of the government, and she is working together with the regions and with the local governments to ensure that we focus in those elements that can really trigger opportunities for, for people staying there, uh, with a strong focus on uh, digital connectivity, 
on this uh, strong focus on the development of the green uh, energy facilities. I was a bit surprised by this idea that uh, the, um, there is a clash between uh, focusing on territorial development and and uh, the green agenda, I would say that we need to ensure precisely that uh, economic activity that takes place in, in these areas is, is sustainable, because that is what's going to, to provide them with an opportunity to continue to grow in, in the future. And, and uh, all of these, of course, will uh, eventually lead to a debate which is not a Spanish debate, I think is a more uh, a broader debate at European or even global level on, on taxation and environmental, environmental um, taxation. This is, as I was saying, a debate where Spain is just participating in, in those uh, changes that will take place at European and, and at global level. Because these challenges are not unique to, to our country, maybe what is quite strong right now is the awareness and the commitment uh, of the government to try to uh, deal with these places and focus in, in, in projects that can be transformative down on the ground, you know, in a precise geographical uh, place. Thank you. Let's go now to the issue of uh, productivity. And this comes from Victor Perez Sanchez, who is doing a PhD at, uh, in economic history here at the LSE and is, I believe, from Salamanca. And the question is regarding the situation in the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, in 2021, for example, he says employment has grown much faster than the GDP growth per capita and therefore it has contributed to reduce uh, productivity per hour worked. Do you think this is just an accounting discrepancy which will disappear relatively soon or is there something else going on? Well, this is an, I have to say your students pose excellent questions. <laughs> you know, these are, these are very pertinent and, and questions and issues that we devote a lot of our uh, time to uh, reflecting because indeed one of the, one of the features that we have seen in the strong recovery last year was the fact that uh, GDP has recovered. There's been a, a, a lag between the recovery of employment and other economic indicators, hard economic indicators, tax revenues, for example, just to give you another uh, element, and uh, the GDP uh, accounting you know, data. And we have been working, I mean, and I know, I know the National Statistical Office is looking into this to see whether this is just a matter of the difficulties of getting uh, some data in the context of the pandemic and, and the very important third wave we suffered in the, in the second quarter of last year, or whether there is something more structural to it. I must say there are some structural changes taking place, which certainly should prompt us to think about our economic indicators and try to modernize them and base them on more different different evidence, uh, administrative data, or big data, you know, coming from all different economic sectors. Uh, I think the, the economic uh, analysis um, discipline has to also modernize its, its sources of, of information in, from this point of view. And um, one of these uh, key changes has to do with, um, with uh, digitalization. And uh, to me, it is obvious that our traditional uh, statistics do not fully capture what we're talking about when we're talking about digitalization. We had a seminar, I know there's a lot of work going on in the OECD and other places beyond GDP, because, well, it strikes me, it strikes anybody, I think, as, as quite um, incoherent, the fact that uh, some of the fastest growing and, and high, highest capitalized uh, companies in the world actually have a part of their revenues which is not accounted for and, and the value added seems to come from data which uh, have no value from a national accounting point of view, you know. So there are a number of questions that I think uh, are not exclusive and are not uh, short term uh, related uh, that should prompt us to also work on, on uh, improving our, our statistical tools. Having said that and beyond what the numbers show, the, the trends that we see in the economy go in the direct, do not go in the direction of lowering uh, productivity, quite the opposite. We see an increase of jobs in areas which have uh, a higher productivity, a higher value added, and therefore, and, and those sectors that, and, and so I, I, would, I would leave it uh, at, this, at this stage, but just uh, 
uh, tickle you also and prompt your, your curiosity about looking into these issues from an academic point of view, because I think there are at this stage more questions than answers in, in this regard. Conscious of time, but there are many questions here as well <laughs> in uh, for coming from the students. And uh, what I'm going to try to is uh, allow go into a question, which is very much about the state of the Spanish decentralized uh, system and uh, the pandemic. Uh, in Spain, um, the government took over the dealing of the pandemic at the beginning, and then it was decentralized to the regions that are among the most decentralized in the world. And the question comes from Miguel Vidal Bover, who just finished his uh, MSc uh, at the LSE and now is a data analyst at, for UN Women in Cairo. Um, the question is, do you believe that the Spanish decentralized system has worked effectively at dealing with a pandemic? And do you think that all regions have received adequate funding uh, to fulfill their mandates? Or has there been a problem of unfunded mandates that may have contributed to uh, a slow reaction to the pandemic at certain stages? Well, here I can be very, very straightforward. Uh, this is, this is a, a question which really has a clear answer, which is we have provided the regions with ample funding to respond to the pandemic. We, they have been properly funded to provide health uh, response, to provide the education response, no doubt about it. And I was just looking at the data actually today uh, about the transfers that came from the central government to the, from the state to the regions. It is unprecedented. The, uh, our top priority has been to be able to respond to the pandemic and we have provided not only uh, non-reimbursable transfers, also the uh, loan-based financing mechanisms uh, to provide liquidity that have been functioning for, for many years, have been open to improve the financial sustainability of the regions, allowing them for the early repayment of their debt so as to benefit from the lower interest rates. So I have to say, uh, no doubt about it. And actually, many of them are showing uh, sharp increases in their own deficit uh, and, and you know, fiscal, fiscal balances, which show that this has, there has not been a lack of financing. Because luckily, we have had a very, an, a very positive environment in terms of financial uh, stability and sovereign debt market stability in, in Europe that has allowed us to provide an, effect an effective response. Different issue is about the distribution of competences, but here I have to say it is the constitutional uh, architecture we have. This is an architecture that allows uh, citizens to have a regional government which is closer to them which is closer to their needs and their priorities. And so uh, this, is the, this is the political system we have given ourselves. And I think that within its complexities, we have been able to work together and we have been able to provide an, an effective response. Let me refer just to the uh, outstandingly successful vaccination uh, process to give you an example of something that has worked very well and has required a very uh, tight coordination between the regions and, and the different levels of government. Of government. Uh, there's a question coming from Luis Roca Llorens, who is a, a Spanish MSc management student here. And it's about startup, the Spanish startup system. Uh, uh, the combined value, he says, of the Spanish startup ecosystem has increased by over 300% since 2015. Given what the Spanish government's focus on, digi on digitalization is uh, with respect to the Spanish economy, do you have plans to accelerate the growth of the Spanish startup ecosystem and reduce the country's brain drain to places like the UK? Yes. <laughs> well, I invited uh, all your students to come and visit us in the summer. Now I should invite them to come and set up their startup in Spain. And then they will never invite me again to give a lecture in, in a UK university again. No, I'm joking, of course. Uh, this, is, this is one of our top priorities because Spain has actually some uh, of the most vibrant ecosystems in, in Europe. Barcelona, Madrid are well-known systems, uh, cities. They are amongst the six uh, more attractive uh, cities to establish a startup. And there are new emerging ones. I was visiting recently Malaga, also Valencia, Bilbao, 
there are many different uh, hubs that are you know popping up and digitalization also allows startups to be established anywhere in the country and that's why i was referring to digital connectivity as a key feature also to fight depopulation of rural areas you know that that also opens new opportunities but so what we have set up is we have published a draft law which is currently uh, in, in the legislative process, which provides for a very advanced uh, tax benefits, also job uh, benefits, visa benefits to attract investment and talent and attract back Spanish talent that may have uh, gone abroad. And we have also set up a, a public-private uh, scale-up fund to uh, fund the growth of um, startups in disruptive technologies, because we do have instruments to support startup foundation, but there was a big gap in terms of the scaling up. And there we, we have, uh, we're going, one important uh, element of our recovery plan is a uh, up to 4 billion euro uh, scale up fund that will, I hope, very soon start to um, announce, you know, investment into, into projects so that the very talented uh, people in Spain, and we have a number of startups such as uh, Wallbox uh, for the uh, chargers um, um, for, for cars, do not have to go abroad to go public, as, as was the case with this, uh, with this company. And this is, this is one of our aims with the investments and, and reforms in their recovery plan. And I have already known a number of people that have told me they are going to come back from the US uh, once the law is uh, attracted by this um, new framework. And I hope that this will also dynamize, you know, the, the uh, uh, productive tissue of the, of the country. We're going to be cut down sharp at four o'clock. There are a lot of questions on the chat. So apologies to everyone who has asked questions. And um, Madam Vice President would not be able to answer because I had not, not had the time to ask, uh, ask them. But just one quick question from last question. Simple question, probably a simple answer, which is from Jose Antonio Belso uh, from the BSc Geography with Economics, uh, and he is, I think, from Elche. Um, he is asking uh, the Spanish government has a projected economic growth of 7% for this year. However, Brussels maintains it at 5.5. What is the reason? for this discrepancy and why is the Spanish government so optimistic? Well, thank you very much for this final question because then I can wrap up with a, with a more general remark. No? Normally we update our macroeconomic uh, table twice a year when uh, this is linked to the European semester and the budgetary process. So normally in the autumn and in the spring when we have to submit draft budgetary plans or draft budget is when we sort of uh, set up our macroeconomic framework. In the last two years, uh, if macroeconomic forecasting is usually difficult, I think it has become uh, extremely complicated in, in this very uh, unprecedented situation and very unstable environment. And so what we have done is focusing not only on statistics and, and uh, aggregated data such as GDP that uh, are published at a quarterly, quarterly frequency and have suffered very intense uh, backward revisions, but having more down to earth uh, data on a daily basis so that we can get the, the sense and the pulse of the economy uh, on a more uh, you know frequent frequent basis uh, to make our decisions. And the second thing we have done is we have been very prudent with our budgets. And that explains why in a less favorable, maybe macroeconomic environment, we will be able to exceed our targets in terms of deficit and debt reduction in 2021 and likewise for 2022 we've been very prudent and that i think gives us a, you know a, a room uh, in the in this regard but to me the most important uh, element of international uh, institutions and the imf uh, issued their their article 4 report uh, to yesterday uh, is that they foresee spain to be one of the engines of growth in europe uh, this year and they foresee an average growth rate, GDP growth rate, uh, around 5% in 2021, 22, 23. And this is precisely our objective. It is to have a, a, a rebound, which is not a transitory, but rather a strong and sustained recovery. In order to do that, we have to continue to make the right decisions uh, in phase two the recovery. <laughs> we certainly have to succeed in, de in deploying the, the recovery plan 
and profit from the uh, extraordinary opportunity of the EU response to the pandemic and be, I wouldn't say optimistic, but rather realistic, but also determined to um, undertake these reforms and to deploy these investments with a strong focus on the future, with a strong focus on you, uh, next generations. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank first everyone who attended this uh, seminar, this discussion with uh, Nadia Calvino. Uh, I would like to thank everyone once again for asking so many questions. It's a pity that we don't have another hour. I think we could feel another hour and more. Uh, we could feel another hour and more uh, in, in this respect. Uh, apologies for those questions that were not asked. I would like to thank, of course, everyone behind the scenes that made this uh, seminar possible, everyone working for LSE events and also at the European Institute and at the Canyana Blanche Center. Professor Ian Begg for being so challenging with his questions and incisive as, as ever. And of course, last but not least, and above all, uh, Vice President Nadia Calvino, who has been so open, so open to be challenged by a tough audience. Um, we are proud here at the LSE of having very, very good students. And, uh, but we're also proud to have someone who is open to respond to those questions without any filters and for being so frank and so forthright in your interventions. So thank you very much. I hope we will be able to see you next time, not on a webinar, but in person. And you're always invited to come to London and join us at any other event that we will organize in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you also from me, Nadia.